Thank you. Thank you for attending the Siberia Summit 2020. Today's workshop, well, we're going to leverage three separate talks in support of our theme, creating a great student experience from any device anywhere, efficiently and cost effectively. My name is Kevin Peebles. I'm with SoftChoice, a technology and solutions provider and an AWS advanced consulting partner. Every day, organizations rely on us to provide insight and expertise that helps them win with their customers and their people. Through our unique points of view, we challenge leaders to think differently about the impact of technology on their organizations, helping them to create success when and where it matters. We've partnered with AWS to bring together thought leaders and subject matters, subject matter experts here today to share three things. One, the cloud journey of Canada's leading online university. Two, how students in the cloud are solving real world challenges. And three, we'll be looking at some programs to free up budget to help you guys fuel innovation. The agenda today um, is going to be from 1.05 to 2.05. We'll be joined first by Jennifer Schaefer, VP of Information Technology and the CIO at Athabasca University. Jennifer will discuss Athabasca's university, Athabasca University's journey and how they've leveraged AWS Cloud to address changes like remote student learning. From 2.05 until 2.45, with Marianne Schroeder, Deputy Director of the UBC and Community Health and Wellbeing Cloud Innovation Center. And Carol Kennett, Digital Innovation Lead AWS, will discuss how UBC students are using the Cloud Innovation Center to solve real world challenges. From 2.50 to 4, our presenters, Dave Hansen and from Amazon Web Services and Skip Purdy from SoftChoice, will provide an overview of a program that helps institutions assess and optimize the current on-premise and or cloud environments and provide tips for migrating to the cloud. And with that, I'm very much looking forward to introducing Jennifer Schaefer, who will be speaking for 45 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Don't miss your opportunity to ask some questions here. Jennifer, thank you for joining us today at Siberia Summit 2020. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kevin. And hello, everyone out there. All I can see is a little eyeball with the number 61. So whoever you 61 wonderful people are, if you have questions, pop them into general chat. But I'd like to go ahead and just get through the presentation. And then what I'll do is uh, you know, take the questions and hopefully um, folks can help me uh, with that moderation piece. <clears throat> so I'd like to start by sharing my screen uh, and we'll just make that's going to work correctly. All right, can I get a pop in the chat that you guys are seeing the screen, please? Awesome, thank you, Laura, Kevin, Karen, thank you very much. All right, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is the journey that we have taken to create the Cloud and Code Campus for Canada's online university, Athabasca University. So just in case you may not know about the power of Alberta innovation that's broadcasting from this great province to the world, um, there's some things that I'd like to share with you about AU in general. AU is now grown to be the fifth largest university in Canada. We are a comprehensive research academic university um, of the province of Alberta. And we give anything from upskilling and professional development short courses that are non-credit all the way through bachelor's, master's and doctoral level programs. Um, one of the cool things, again, coming out of Alberta Innovation that you may not know is that Athabasca University in 1995, so only a year after the first commercial browsers were available, came out with the first online MBA program in the world. Uh, pretty cool. So we are over 50 years old. Uh, we began as a distance education solution for many of our Canadians who were uh, deployed overseas, who were in sports leagues, or who just simply could not attend an on-campus uh, experience based on 
um, their whoever they are. So um, with that, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about how when you have 24-7 student demand, you need a 24-7 solution to your campus. And for us, our campus is online, um, completely online. We have administrative offices across the province of Alberta, in northern Alberta, obviously in Athabasca, uh, in Edmonton, both Edmonton downtown and in North Edmonton, and in Calgary. But our students are coming at us from every single uh, province. Um, the majority of our students is a, usually a neck and neck tie between domiciled in Alberta or domiciled in Ontario. But we've got Canadian students from every province and we've got Canadian students from every territory. And we are also got students who are domiciled in 87 countries globally and growing. So that's a little bit about who AU is as Canada's only online university, um, a really remarkable place uh, that we share uh, uniquely in the post-secondary system for the nation of Canada and all of its provinces. So what I'm going to talk about today is related to the strategy of how did we actually do such a major digital transformation. I'll talk a little bit about strategy, then I'll talk about execution or the operational strategy of the overall innovation strategy, tell you a little bit about lessons learned, and then uh, given the theme of our Cybera conference of what's next, talk to you about what does it mean now that we have fully moved our academic and operations um, fully across all faculties, all centers and institutes uh, to our AU cloud that is powered by AWS? And then, of course, I'm open for all kinds of questions, of which I'm sure you'll have many. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the name of our uh, five-year IT strategy, which is now in the beginning of its third year in execution. It's called RISE. And that's an acronym, as we IT folk love to give acronyms to things. Uh, that means how do we show up and work together as a community, whether it is online or whether we are able to see each other. We will be responsive, innovative, sustainable, engaging. And that's how we try to show up and support each other as all of us are modernizing our own skills uh, to be relevant to um, powerful, innovative technology in 2020 and beyond. So the first thing I'm going to talk about with the strategy is how important it is for you to have an end to end vision for your institution. Now, I'm not aware of the now 69 that appear to be watching this, whether you are from universities, colleges, um, agencies, boards or commissions of the government of Alberta, ministries within the GOA itself or uh, friends from different corporate institutions. But this kind of strategy that I'm going to talk about actually would apply to any private sector, public sector that's looking to take its cloud journey. You have to work, and some of you who may uh, know AWS or have read Ahead in the Clouds, which is a phenomenal book that I recommend um, to get an even deeper dive on how AWS did it themselves um, over a decade ago. Um, it's really important to start with the end in mind. So what is the vision that you are trying to get to here? And for us, it was 24 seven state of the art, uh, student support and accessibility for any Canadian, no matter where they live, no matter how remote or rural, to be able to participate in post-secondary education from home. So many of us are caretakers of various types, we're parents, or we're simply working a number of jobs um, to make ends meet, and we simply can't um, as much as we might want to go to an on-campus uh, location at a certain time and in a certain place uh, based on the priorities we have uh, in our families. So for us, it was about really defining what we needed the cloud to be. And there were three key areas that we understood the cloud could help us as we moved and transformed the business of our digital university to a 2020 uh, construct. First, the, the cloud was a business and an academy enabler. It's not a tech project. If you only talk about it like a technical project, you lose the richness of having, in our case as a university, our academic excellence and expertise contribute um, to the evolution of the actual vision as you get it implemented. And that would be true if you're a corporate for your product development arms, your R&D folk. These are people who really can start to leverage the cloud once you get it in place for them. So for us as a business and academy enabler for our students, we made sure that they had access to AWS Educate uh, credits 
so that they could play into the AWS console and start to be skilled themselves in how to do this. It's uh, You can go into the console without being a technical person. It's more like just learning your way around a, um, a complex but very useful website. Um, it was important for our students that we gave them the foundations of cloud training that AWS provides through AWS Educate and also the job board. Um, you may not know if you don't hire technical professionals in the province of Alberta, or I would actually say in Western Canada overall, we have a tremendous demand for skilled technical talent that has relevant 2020 technical skills. Many folk, myself included, know how to do things the way we did them in pre-cloud era. Some of our folk even know how to do things in pre-internet era, but there is a whole discipline of languages, techniques, and processes that our IT folk and those who just simply aspire to make their small business run better, for instance, need to know. So those foundational curriculum that is available to your students through AWS Educate, I just really wanted to stress how important that is. It's not just about upskilling the people that work for you in your organization. It's also about the greater good of helping citizens in our province become better educated so that they can be more competitive in our economic landscape. For our professors, as I said, in a university context, those are our chief innovators. That's our R&D, is the amazing research our um, academic professors are doing. For them, the Cloud Research Credits and AWS Academy, which is a higher level, sophisticated set of course curriculum that professors can integrate directly into their offerings. And um, that, again, tremendous benefit, not only for the professors, but also for the students and then our broader workforce who become educated in these relevant skills. And then administrative staff. This is the most important driver of how our organizations thrive, is the culture of our organization. So reskilling digitally and the technical aspects of reskilling, growing digital literacy so our staff feel comfortable in the back office or the front office, who have often been used to using um, frankly, in public sector, rather antiquated methods of communication and process engineering. Have them feel that pride of being able to utilize uh, relevant uh, business processes that the cloud can bring to them, their skills development, and of course, customer service modernization, which for us are our students. Cloud as an organizational change driver is a key part of the cultural changes that you're making strategically as well in this end-to-end -end vision. So for us, it was consolidating that similar back office and front office units and their processes to a one AU service model without losing the specificity of expertise that certain experts have in these functions as they relate to various, again, for universities, various faculty needs and program needs. Ability to use artificial intelligence and machine learning across one enterprise data lake of records and interactions. Uh, it goes without saying that if you have a fractured um, set of hodgepodge data sets that aren't interrelated, you can't very well train AI and ML off of it because it's not even in one place. So a little bit of the plumbing basics is that, you know what, you got to bring that data together to start making sense of it beyond knowing a little bit here from this system and a little bit here from that system and trying to make sense of it for your, your student or customer set. And lastly, in one fell swoop, which would normally be many, many different budgeted programs, at least again in, in the post-secondary context, modernizing your business continuity planning, modernizing your disaster recovery and taking that worry right off your risk management chart, modernizing your unified communication strategy. So how do your employees do business together in order to make um, uh, better solutions for your customers? Modernizing data protection and permissioning at a data field level, something that's been hard for um, us to get to in public sector for quite a while. And global content delivery, most importantly, the last item here is infrastructure security. In post-secondary, we've seen the rise of attacks on post-secondary data sets. Uh, most of you who are in post-secondaries will, will know that we are now required to hold social insurance numbers of our students. And so that is a very key per, uh, 
key personal piece of information that needs to be kept as absolutely secured as possible. The cloud allows you a level and sophistication of security that is not achievable in on-premise structures. And um, it's one of the big myths that you'll hear is, oh, but it's not as secure. When we did penetration testing on our former on-premise model, what we used to think of as the absolute most secure on-premise architecture, which for those of you in tech will know that as the ring dark architecture approach, it had been infiltrated in many, many different ways over the years, because in, in my case, we, we didn't have uh, a cybersecurity program in place other than, you know, when really something obvious would happen and you'd have to you'd have to take action. So one of the big leverages of how do you make your organization better is how do you make it more secure and cloud really helps you do that. Lastly, your innovation, your efficiency provider. We're all looking to do more and serve more customers or more students with less. It's just the way of the world. And we're trying to do that just like everyone else. You can run faster, more secure, and constantly improving infrastructure at less cost than on-premise. I have some data to show you there. Uh, you can redeploy your technical talent away from watching blinky lights on server stacks or, or creating uh, operating system imaging to actually doing the creative technical roles that your customers and your employees that are not in IT need and can't get because your folks are working on the back end stuff that's pretty drudgery if you've had to do it. And most of us have if we've been around for a while. You can spin up your operations or research clusters. You can provision cloud artificial intelligence and machine learning tools for online learning and data mining. Um, maybe that's a little bit more specific to those of you who are in uh, the learning space as I am, but it's a huge, huge thing. Again, not having to go to 15 different chatbot vendors and 27 different um, learning analytics vendors, you really start to create a system-wide strategy that's really exciting. And you can provide self-serve access to computing with governed guardrails. So you no longer have to be worried if, you're, if your researcher wants to spin up something quite interesting because you have governed guardrails about, based on the workloads they need, what can be spun up for them. Um, always a challenge previously in the on-prem world. So that's really, I know I spent a lot of time on that. I won't go as uh, slowly on all my other slides, but I thought that, you know, if I could leave you with one thing, it's that you first have to think of your end-to-end -end vision strategy. Go out five years, go out for some of us 10 years and work your way back from that. This is not an immediate fix. This is not an IT lift and shift. This is a enabler of your business or your academy or your um, ministry. Okay, so um, the truth of it is you can't get there with what you've got now and you can't get there with the status quo, but your status quo are your most experienced employees often. So how do you hack your culture to help them get super excited and be a part of your journey? I am not gonna say it's easy. Culture hacking is the hardest thing that we all do as leaders, but it's also really fun, especially when that one person who was like this for a year suddenly uncrosses their arms and goes, you know what? This is pretty cool. I'm into this now. And I, trust me, you can get there. Um, we had some pretty heavy headwinds in our organization and it did take us some time to help people understand the art of the possible, uh, but we're well on our way now and, and it's, it's quite exciting. So the point here is that there's other things that you do, again, now this might be a little bit more technical because I'm the VPIT, but it has to do with the organization of your business fundamentally. And that is, um, how do you get all the executives involved and their second in commands to understand what a cloud journey really is? AWS had a fabulous workshop on that that we did as an executive team. I report to my president. And so when I say executive team, I mean the vice presidents that report to the president and their second in commands, deputy or AVP level. Uh, it was really fun to watch people go, I had no idea that you know cloud was actually part of an organizational transformation to growth and um, you know nimbleness and new business. I kind of thought it was just a big IT thing in the back of the house that nobody really cares about. So that is, I would really recommend that as your first step. And you can see, I put the years here, that was 2018 for us. Yes, we fully moved to the cloud in June of 2020 after a six month rapid cloud migration set of sprints that started in January, 2020. But if my team hadn't done and the executive team that I work with hadn't done their pieces of these 2018 and 2019 bullets, 
we wouldn't have been able to do the rapid cloud migration. So that's my point here is kind of to show you some of the other things you got to really set up well. So for us, we needed to tie what we were doing both to national strategy, which is our future skills strategy at the national level. Um, for those of you not in post-secondary, post-secondary has provincial leadership. We don't have a national strategy like in the, in the United States, for instance, but we do at the skills level. And there is a tremendous amount of gray and bleed in a good way between learning new skills and what we would consider the more traditional post-secondary learning. They're actually very, very, very intertwined. Okay, so what we also um, made sure that we did here is, so provincially, how is this important to us? Again, beyond just a use uh, strategy, also very important for Alberta economic diversification. How do I run um, the internet of things on my crops, in the field, if I don't have people that I that can work with me or me myself know a little bit about how to use cloud to process all that data. This is the reality of what every body shop, every farm, every organization is moving to or has already moved. We're a little bit behind in Western Canada, but we're getting there pretty fast. And of course, we've got counterparts in the Vancouver area who are, who are very far ahead in this space and we're learning from them too. So, the other piece here was, as I said before, experience training for all the AU employees, not just IT. Let everyone have the option to take the training. And you will be surprised how many people do because they're curious and we want to empower their curiosity. The AUIT curriculum, this is very specifically the curriculum that I um, put together with AWS that I required all of the IT staff and myself to take. Um, I didn't have I didn't have experience in this before I took these things either, right? I needed to learn just alongside with everybody else in, in the IT division. And then we really celebrate and we reimburse those AWS certifications. They are um, multi-course based, they are rigidly exam based, and they really mean something when your folks get that associate or professional level. So you want to encourage that. Um, also, uh, this is probably more unique to public sector, but um, it was very important that we updated and created a digital governance control framework of IT policy and procedures. For post-secondary, it's sort of our rule book, how we run our organization. Uh, we did that. The link is there um, because if you want to utilize any of that, please go ahead. We followed the recommendations of the Office of the Auditor General of Alberta to the Alberta post-secondary system itself um, that dated back a few years and we implemented all the aspects that they wanted, plus we added other ones related to um, digital, the 24 seven uh, maintenance of the whole, and then shared those back with the OAG so that as they move more things to the digital space, um, or they move more things to the cloud-based space, that they can kind of uh, use that as well. So please feel free to use any of that if it's appropriate and applicable to, to your area. That was in 2018 and 19. There's a very large consultative process that happens with rewriting the rule book. So we, we had some protocols there that we had to follow. And then finally, and this does take the longest time in the public sector, but it's well worth it, is how we are implementing a new IT division of the university IT resources, bringing them together in essentially offices related to the key underpinnings of running 100% digital business. So this might look different to you if you're not maybe only 20% of your business is digital, 80% is in place or on campus, but in our case, it's all of it. So a cloud business office, a digital strategy office, and a digital security office, and the work that people are doing together is cross-functional and in um, what we call squads or tribes, those are two terms from the Spotify engineering culture body of work that came out in 2012 and there've been many um, kind of uh, improvements upon the model. And um, we too have a version of that model that works for AU. Um, most importantly there, for those who care about this kind of thing, I'll just mention real quick, the platform engineering squad of squads so that you can have autonomy in the single squads, but you have to have the guardrails that fit your governance and risk management um, practices. So um, we are still working through this and we'll be working on this. And I know I'll be continuously improving it, but it's one of my favorite things about this because now people are working together in functional areas, not product lines and product teams like I used to do back in the day before post-secondary, I'm sure many of you have as well, but rather functional areas that essentially will always support 
your customer base or your student base in that way. So those are the pieces of, of real deep culture hacking that had to happen in order for us to get to the point of actually rapid cloud migration. All right, this next slide um, is really a highlight uh, from the AWS perspective of specifically what we did around securing all the layers of our stack that are in our AU cloud powered by AWS. So this gets really technical. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I'm sure that any of the AWS folks on the line, if you have questions related to that, can really take you through this. What I can tell you is, and this is because I previously was in the financial sector, institutional trading and finance, it's so essential for us to treat our, if you're in post-secondary, for us to treat our students' information as the highly valuable information that it is and secure it appropriately and secure their journeys with us and secure the information about themselves that they are seeing in their grades and in their, um, their learning supports. This is really important. We need to take it really seriously. And, you know, I couldn't have gotten a more, um, a more flexible partner who really felt and understood me when I said, I need this to be as secure as a banking platform. That's the level of security I need to see our infrastructure have for our students and out of respect for them. All right, execution, I'll move through this quick. What's under the rock? So what's under the rock is key. Many of you, myself included, we inherited um, something in the IT world. And we're not even sure what we inherited because we walk in and you might ask for, please show me all the, all, all the architectural mapping of all infrastructure. Please show me how the subnets are working. Please show. And the great people that work for you might look at you and go, uh, we don't have that. We've kind of grown organically over a period of years. A lot of stuff wasn't documented or those folks retired. You know, we, we kind of know where everything's at, but you know, don't be afraid of that. I cannot stress enough that I did not walk into the position at Athabasca University with a whole portfolio of diagrams so I could understand what had been built and how it could be improved. I had none of that. And why is that important? Because you just have to be humble enough to pick up the rock. What's under that rock? What's under that rock? What's under that rock? And and don't feel bad about it. Like it, it nobody's to blame for the fact that everybody who went digital post 1995 was to a certain extent adding sometimes subtracting, usually just adding um, as they went, right? It, it's how this organic development into digital business happened. But at a certain point you say, okay, time out. Now let's set this up. Now let's get the plumbing right. Then we're gonna bring the walls in and we're gonna do the design. Now we're gonna have a house that's in order, right? So start there, don't be worried about it. Um, a real obvious one, which I'm sure many of you already know how to do, is you do want to find something that can be proof of concept so that the people who are afraid of the cloud in general start to get their hands wet. And of course, you're doing that at the same time as they're getting exposed to the new training. So they have something to do. You don't want to give them the training. They don't have anything to do. They won't remember anything. And then in 2019, and, and the reason I actually bulleted this out is to show you this wasn't just, OK, we kind of think we know things. Let's just go to the cloud. We had to do all kinds of uh, deeper understanding of what do we really have hooked up to what? Where are the handshakes with external SaaS solutions? What's on that subnet? All those kinds of questions. So AWS has a really good migration readiness assessment workshop that helped us define, here's what you know, here's what you don't know, and here's what you didn't even know you need to know and you don't know it. And then we had some really good um, different views of that from some of the good partners that we all work with. So in our case, Dell, we did a really good environment scan with them. Then TSO Logic, which is now, it was separate when we used them. They're now part of AWS and the, and the service is called the Migration Evaluator. We did their migration evaluation. And then we also worked with Scalar, who's a partner to AWS on environment analyses. And lastly, but most importantly, because I told you this wasn't just like, we're gonna fake define IT core and just hope that nobody actually goes, wait a minute, I see a whole bunch of IT outside of this thing called IT core. What are you doing about that? We actually did the hard work of going out, finding, documenting, and mapping in across all the AB, the Alberta offices. So the what's under that rock, what's that server under your desk? What's that file share over there? What are those access databases over there? I mean, it was pretty wacky. But we went for it. And you know what? It's kind of fun. So it's sort of like, okay, I'm going to date myself. Remember that old game back in the day, Hunt the Wumpus, 
right? It was literally like hunt the wampus of crazy tech. And we found it and you guys will have that too. And so just sort of enjoy that part of the journey because it is explorative, but you need it. Here's why. You can't write a business case of how much money you're gonna save moving from on-premise to cloud if you don't know the true cost of all the on-premise stuff you're actually paying for. Maybe you're not paying for it in your IT division because you have an artificial smaller definition of IT core, but you can bet some other part of your operations is paying for it. So it's, you gotta look at the big picture on this one. All right, so the execution sprints, as I said, they were January to July. Um, and this just gives you an idea of uh, kind of the size of it. Um, and for us, we had actually, you know, I, I would say one of the things where you would be better prepared is if you've already taken a journey with your teams to move to um, VMware at all, it does make it that much easier. So we knew that we had to use our VMware knowledge to get us into AWS because we didn't have core AWS knowledge that we could just jump to. Um, and so that's how we did it. There's different ways you can skin that cat. So you kind of want to talk to your partners in AWS about that aspect of it. Okay, so what's the ROI? Let's let's get to the let's get to the real deal here. So, you know, importantly, tying it to institutional strategy, uh, moving the entire operations, administration, faculty, back office, and front offices into one secure cloud did meet does meet, continues to meet 57% of the goals that we outlined as part of the digital transformation for Canada's online university. These facts and figures, I kind of, it's kind of cheesy to read them out, hey, but I guess they're there and you might not all see the screen big enough. So five areas that we looked at ROI, business benefit, operational resilience, organizational productivity, sustainability, and cost savings. So oper operational resilience, we are going to save um, about 19.2 million in cost avoidance and we're increasing our uptime by 32% because we're using cloud and not on-prem. So um, I won't go into these in too much detail unless people have technical questions because I realize some of you may be like, all right, she's lost me now. So I'll try to keep it a little high level. Organizational productivity, this one will make sense to everybody. If you're not serving the, the if you're not a slave to the blinky lights and the uh, creating images of uh, for machines, um, there's a lot that you can do in two ways. One, and in our case, it was over 92,000 hours over five years where the monitoring, the upgrading and troubleshooting of infrastructure can now be refocused into the creative technology needs in the R&D space that my professors have and they're demanding it and they've been waiting so patiently. And so now we're moving towards that relationship. That's part of our what's next I'll talk about. But additionally, look, you don't put things into the cloud and then it just runs itself. It is still infrastructure that requires care and feeding, but it's so much more efficient that you save in our case, our case again, 41% or about 26,000 hours of efficiency um, based on how we had to run our on-premise situation beforehand. So powerful for us. Sustainability would be very important, especially for those of you who have really large on-premise footprints, far larger than Athabasca had. And that is, and this is based on a series of modeling, um, modeling work that AWS has done in the cost of, that they have to run all of the data centers in, that power their cloud. 84% reduction in amount of power required compared to previous on-prem operating model. So I actually, I actually get to take that off of um, our expenses at the university um, in a huge way. And that's actually very important. Um, but then the cost savings. So this is the real, um, you know, prize of it all for us. And because we did that deep, deep dive to figure out what do we really spend in running on-premise infrastructures, plural, all over the place across the province, uh, we're saving 16 million or about 65% compared to running the on-premise models that I had previously. And that's all based on our own data. Your numbers will be different. And this is also why it's important that you have really have to think of this strategically, not an add-on, because you don't want to be have all this cost related to on-premise and the care and feeding of that. Plus, now you're also adding an, a cost to running the cloud. Like you really need to kind of think it through more strategically from a business perspective. Um, so the rapid cloud migration piece, which was intense, uh, this is our own team's time and the time of AWS on this with us. 
Um, there are architects uh, that we needed special expertise advisement on because obviously we had started training, but we were still on the training wheels as far as how do you work this cloud thing. We've gotten better. Um, so that was about 1.2 million for us for the rapid cloud migration with the payback period in under three months. So our five-year ROI, and this is a very conservative ROI, um, is I didn't want to oversell this, but it is what it is for us. It's 1,200%. Uh, so we're pretty happy about that. Um, some people are saying, yeah, but how do you actually get those cost savings? I'll touch very quickly on that. And I see I'm at 139. I'm not exactly sure how much time I have. So if somebody wants to pop in, you can talk until X, then I'll make sure to speed up. This is probably that. But there are key areas, capacity planning. So you're not provisioning ahead of time, purchasing ahead of time. Um, purchasing over peak because you're worried about what happens if everybody gets on at a certain time. You only pay for what you need. That's the most fun about getting better all the time with the cost of this is directly related to the fact you can see it. So it's almost like a gaming platform to see how you could make a piece of infrastructure run more efficiently at a lower cost to the organization and your actual IT people get to have a say in that now. That's not something they ever really had a say in. They had no idea how much, uh, you know, a Palo Alto firewall was. I did, right? So you kind of really start to educate them on the financial efficiencies of running technology too. And that's no small thing. That's an important piece of our capabilities as well. So reducing IT costs associated with owning and managing infrastructure and redeploying those uh, talented folk into the areas of highest demand by your customers, your consumers, or your constituents, your cohorts within the organization. For us, our professors, demands of the students, and that kind of thing. Um, it helps you to build that culture of cost optimization. I kind of just referred to that. But also the pricing model. So if you can buy up front, you can save quite a bit of money, which is useful, particularly for those of us that have to go through that painful annual budgeting exercise anyway. It's good to kind of plan out, okay, and we'll purchase this. Um, but you can also do spot instances, which are up to 90% off of on-demand price. And that's when you're spinning up an environment just for a period of time. I need a dev environment over here to run these simulation models. Okay, I don't need it a week from now. So that's another way that you can buy computing power at commodity pricing at a lower price than if you're just buying you know, what you need right then. Uh, and obviously the more gigabytes stored in and out and, and transferred within the AWS environment, the lower the cost per gigabyte. So these are the useful ways of how cost savings are actually achieved. It's not a smoke and mirrors game. Lessons learned, um, end to end vision planning, super important. Start the education early. You've got to make it across your entire business or your entire academy and back office, front office operations. It's not just an IT project. You go ahead and, and be uncomfortable, but also have a good sense of humor and do those multiple technical assessments so that you can find the find the crazy bugs under the rocks because they'll be there. Uh, very important, you always have to look for and actively address the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So there's three big myths when it comes to cloud. You've probably heard them all. You may have even said them. Cloud is more expensive. No, it's not. Cloud is less secure. No, it's not. If you move to the cloud, I lose my job. No, you don't. So granted, we'll all have slightly different versions of those answers that might be more poetic than mine, but it's how I answer it now over and over and over again for the past three years and even before that at a different university. Um, the next item here, creating and securing full enterprise IT infrastructure is equally as important as moving from on-premise to cloud. Because again, if you don't govern it, you can't secure it. If you can't secure it, it's left open and all you need is one way in for uh, your system to get infiltrated. So you need to take cybersecurity um, as a, I say in, in our organization, I say, you know what? The word security is in everybody's title. It's the silent S in everybody's title and it really has to be. And then once the rapid cloud migration is accomplished, good job, you finally got your plumbing fixed. So what do we do now? What, what happens here? So I already talked to you about the inputs, executive commitment, permission to find and analyze, and hands-on training. I already talked about the ROI of cost, business benefit, operational resilience, organizational productivity, and sustainability. And now I want to tell you about, so what comes next? Great, Jennifer, you've put, you've put all of AU into its own cloud now. So what? What do you do? Well, one of the things that we're taking on, and we're in deployment of this now, um, is a 
multi-project digital security program program. And in that program are things like um, zero trust cybersecurity. So those of you that are in the cybersecurity area, you know that's sort of like uh, the great goal that's almost unachievable because of issues with governance and permission and people blocking you and all this kind of thing. But in our case, what we're starting with towards that goal eventually over time, doesn't happen immediately, is multi-factor authentication at all the end user devices, okay? And so if I give you all the end user devices and I ensure there's multi-factor authentication on it, then I'm, I'm absolutely helping to secure what can typically be one of the easy way ins to your infrastructure. So that's a really cool um, part of our strategy and our outcomes that we're working on now. We're also working on that one AU data lake. So I talked before about what kind of AI and ML are you going to run on baby data set 1, 15, 32, X, Y, Z, and they have no relation to each other. That's a dog's breakfast, you know? It's not gonna get you anything. But if you move that formerly fractured data, you can harmonize the data sets. If you use uh, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, if you implement those data security levels, which you can do because you can understand it, and if you have the ability to share that data more rapidly using automation, you're improving the way you do business in the back office and front office, you're improving the ability for students to get what they need, when they need it, how they need it, and you're super empowering your, in our case again, our R&D arm, which is our professors, our researchers. And that's really cool too. So what I did here, because I thought, you know, I've got to tell people what we're looking at because sometimes you'll get a lot of different vendors trying to sell you point solutions related to aspects of your business or aspects of technology. And it used to be that uh, VPITs or CIOs, um, like we had to kind of try to balance that crazy bucket of stuff and SaaS solutions out there. A platform like AWS, which, which really is this infrastructure and platform as a service, now allows you to use so many of their pieces. However, they are also not like some vendors, uh, oh, well, you better not use anything else. You better only use my stuff. And if they were, then they wouldn't see the adoption that they've seen and the market share that they've taken, right? So look, that was my concern too. I'm like, you know what? I'm Ian Watson runs, runs rings around everybody. Like I gotta be able to use that. I gotta be able to use Cortana because it's built into Microsoft and O365 is our work productivity suite. You know, I'm not gonna go and swap that all over to AWS. So there's key strategic partnerships as part of our enterprise infrastructure that you need to be able to work with in the future in this platform. And that's a big, to me, one of the best selling points about AWS is holy, like I really can bring everybody to the party together. I'm not gonna get anybody, you know, dropping something in the punch bowl because they're not happy that you didn't buy their product number 27 in their stack. So what are we doing specifically? We've got research work going on now in educational assistant coaching to the students and in virtual internships with our students. There we use IBM Watson and some of the provisioners of IBM Watson. In the operational world, we've got the Cortana scheduler. Those of you in O365, you're probably experimenting a bit with that as well right now. So are we We're trying to figure out how best can we utilize that for efficiency and scheduling. Um, and then Amazon or AWS has so many pieces that are uh, highly, highly useful for our researchers, for our, um, our pedagogical implementations in our integrated learning environment, which we are moving towards quickly. Um, as well as what do we do with all this data we've got? How do we how do we make sense of it? So not to sound like I'm just rattling off products here, but really what they're for. So text to speech, model training, um, chatbots, recognition on images, as that can relate to things like, I don't know if you 88 are interested in what I've been saying or if you're drooling out of the side of your mouth, because thankfully I can't see you. But if my AI bot were there, they could tell me, you're losing it, kid. They're, they're asleep, right? So. It's fun, it's good stuff. Um, the, the NLP, um, Managed Natural Language Processing, is actually going to be an extremely powerful tool for you on your data set. So even I was scared of, oh my God, don't make me go through an early 2000s version of knowledge management where I try to make sense of an organization's millions and millions of data sets because I'm gonna cry because that was the most painful thing I ever had to live through. It's not as painful nowadays. And I'm learning that because I'm taking my little courses and I'm participating and I'm getting there. So 
you, you'd be surprised. You think your data is a gong show? Actually, there's a lot that NLP can do to help you um, get that in a harmonized, um, actionable set of data sets far quicker than we did back in the day. And then uh, transcribe auto speech recognition, hugely important. So right away, you have the ability to start working with different languages, um, which is really a very important part for accessibility globally uh, for post-secondary. OK, so that's a little bit about the what's next and where we're at. And I think I've come to my end. So I'll stop sharing, I think. Uh, if Yeah, I'll turn off screen sharing. I don't know if there are questions in general chat. I kind of have it open, but I just see a link to Hunt the Wumpus. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I did, I did kind of age myself there, didn't I? So let's see, are there questions? The Q&A tab, thank you. I will have to go there to read it. When writing your business case, did you factor in the cost of things you didn't have and weren't paying for, but should have had, for example, robust and comprehensive disaster recovery or business continuity planning? What an awesome question, Darren. No, we didn't. So remember I said that that 12,000% return on, a, on an investment over five years was 1,200%, um, sorry, not 12,000%. Um, I said that was very conservative. We specifically didn't put things like that in there because <laughs> as we, we had it in an earlier draft, so not specifically DR and BCP, but we had things related to cybersecurity risk and, and those kinds of things, but other items as well. And it, it started to look like such a no brainer story that it almost looked like, you know, what kind of big fish story are you telling me here, Jennifer? So we really, we really whittled it back to what we do know. Here is what we know. Here's what we're spending on. I didn't put the slide in here. It's very detailed, but it's uh, on networking, on servers, on compute, on storage, right? So we did it that way. But I think your idea is a fabulous one because you could um, show that to your executive team and it would really help you make the case even beyond knowing what your current on-premise infrastructure run rate over five years is based on your past. Okay. Agreed. You do need them to 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 break them out, though. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Darren. Oh, another cute. It's kind of dear Remo product engineers. Why do you make the speaker go between a chat and a Q and A tab? Okay. Um, well, I I actually don't see another question. It told me that there still was a question in Q and A, but it looks like there's not. Here's Graham. Graham, are there other questions that I'm missing in the in the UX of this yeah, particular? Yeah, well, it looks like everyone was very innovative with your uh, earlier question here. So it looks like another question popped up. Would this degree of cloud infrastructure integration be useful for smaller or newer educational institutions or organizations? Oh, heck yeah. The smaller you are, the better, because you're just whipping this stuff up and being 2020 like right off the bat. It's it's really rough when you inherit a legacy of this is how we've always done things. So if you're starting in a new place, uh, Valerie, I think you're in a fantastic place to start. And if you're starting in a new place and you haven't built it, tie it all in that cascading goals type of framework that I'm, I'm sure you use already to your institutional or corporate business plan, right? And then it becomes obvious. If you're a uh, you're saying you're an educational organization, so I'm not sure if you're uh, a, a, a college or university or if a public sector or if you're private sector or not-for-profit, but if you're private sector or not-for-profit social enterprise, um, you can really show your board of directors very easily the cost of running this in a modern way versus if you had to start to secure, protect, and stabilize on-premise infrastructure, especially if you're a near virtual workforce and you don't even really want offices and server closets. Well, tying, tying in with that question, um, you know, if you have very little infrastructure, how do you how do you get started? Well, <laughs> I'm starting to sound like a sales pitch. I don't mean to, but you know, what I would do is I would reach out. I would say I'm at the beginning of this journey, and AWS, who can I talk to? Right now, AWS has some really good partners. Who, if you don't have staff at all that you want to have trained and in this space, which I did, I, I had a huge 
focus as part of our five-year IT strategy because they are public sector employees to help them be educated to be 2020 relevant technical um, um, technicians in their various fields. But if you don't really have that and you need what we would call kind of the managed service of the whole because you're a small organization, then AWS has very specific partners who do that work. So it would probably be a combination of, of trying to find through an RFP the right, if, if you do RFP, if you're corporate, lucky you, you don't have to do RFP. Uh, but you, you'd want to kick the tires around some of the AWS partners regardless, right? Especially if you're like, but I don't even have the people, Jennifer. So how would I, how would I take our infrastructure there without the people? Then I would go a managed services route for sure. It's often what we have to do in the cybersecurity space. At Athabasca University, we have a, a managed security service provider in the cybersecurity uh, space with ISA that's out of Toronto and supports the federal government uh, cybersecurity needs as well for similar reasons, right? One of the hardest parts about being a leader in technical digital professionals in Western Canada is there's just not enough technical digital professionals in Western Canada yet, right? We need more of them. So I would go the managed services route.